Hello and welcome to the Society for the Environment's latest webinar, the third of a five-part series with the umbrella topic of natural capital. The recording of part one is now freely available to watch on our website and YouTube channel, and part two will be following shortly. In this series, we have a selection of expert speakers joining us to look at the theory of natural capital, how it should be implemented, examples of good practice and insights into the benefits for both the environment and for business. My name is Phil Underwood. I'm the engagement manager here at the Society for the Environment. You don't need to know much about me, but if you have any questions following this webinar, then my details are on your screen now. Please feel free to contact me with any queries you have around SOCEM or uh, Chartered Environmentalist or RF Tech registration. Uh, if it's about natural capital, I may well be able to get some answers for you from the expert speakers we have today. I am certainly not the expert in that field. As a way of an introduction to ourselves, very quickly, you are watching a Society for the Environment webinar. We hold two professional registers for environmental professionals, the Chartered Environmentalist or CM register and the Registered Environmental Technician or IOV Tech register. In order to become a Chartered Environmentalist, you'll need to be a member of and apply via one of these 24 professional bodies. You can become uh, an RF tech via three of these bodies, which are now highlighted on your screen. If you want to find out more, then please visit uh, socam.org.uk, which is in the, the bottom left hand corner, or inquire with the relevant professional body directly. They can point you in the right direction, provide guidance, and many can even offer a mentor service to get to you towards the, the RF tech or, or CM standards within their bodies. Now, today's webinar, we have two guests with us today to discuss the topic of natural capital. First up is Sarah Faulkner, who is a Chartered Environmentalist via SAIM, the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, and is a Regional Environment and Rural Affairs Advisor at NFU, which is short for National Farmers Union. Welcome to Sarah. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Sarah will be focusing on the existing natural capital benefits from farming and rural land ownership with a look ahead to how this contribution will grow and develop in the future. Before I hand over to Sarah, a quick reminder to use the Q&A option in your toolbar at any stage and, and I will ask these questions to Sarah after we've heard from both talks. Um, so Sarah, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, it's over to you. Hi, well I'm Sarah Faulkner. I am the work for the National Farmers Union and I'm the Regional Environment Advisor in the West Midlands region. So my role is to work with our farming members on a, a wide variety of projects and I'm just one of a network of Regional Environment Advisors. There's one in every NFU region and then we have a team of environmental specialists based at our headquarters as well. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. So today's presentation is very much from the farming perspective and I just wanted to give you an insight into the natural capital discussion that's currently happening within agriculture um, and just to give you a flavour of some of the issues that are arising. And the three main themes I'm going to cover are the new environmental land management scheme, um, new markets and opportunities through natural capital and then just briefly I'm just going to go through our net zero aspiration as an industry as well. So just a little bit about the NFU um, before I start. We're the largest farming organisation in the UK and we currently represent approximately 50,000 farms and growers across England and Wales. Uh, we've been going since we were founded in 1908 and we've got a unique network of local offices, um, branches and advisors across England and Wales. Um, our headquarters are at Stoneley in Warwickshire and we've also got offices in London and Brussels. And you can find additional information on all the topics I'm going to cover, cover today on our website, which is nfuonline.com. And that includes our recent report called United by Our Environment, Our Food and Our Future, which contains many of the themes that I'm going to talk about today. Farmers, they face a global challenge of feeding a glowing, growing urbanising population. And the UK population is set to approach 70 million by 2025. 71% of UK land is under agricultural management, 
so it's by far our biggest land use within UK. Farmers are custodians of the countryside and our industry has already embarked on a long journey of protecting and maintaining the British countryside, carrying out a huge amount of work to enhance landscape, benefit soil, water and air, encourage wildlife and reduce our impact on the climate. But there's still more to do and our ambition is to continue to improve our environmental performance, but also to keep food production at the heart of what farmers do. Our farmers are farming through a period of absolutely unprecedented uncertainty. Um, we have a new agriculture bill on the horizon, we have a new environment bill, um, and that is leading to a whole set of new challenges. Um, and that's having a tangible impact now on business decision making. So in terms of the challenges, we've got a new support system coming through as we lose our um, previous support system that we had through CAP schemes, which are the European schemes, and we're building a new environmental land management scheme from scratch. So that leads to a huge amount of uncertainty about the future. There's potentially a new regulatory framework through the Environment Bill and the Agriculture Bill, and new and emerging environmental legislation, and also the other sorts of, of um, legislation that a farmer would have to deal with as well. So animal welfare, food hygiene, a whole raft of regulations. One of the biggest issues is trade, international trade, and on what terms we're going to be trading into the future. And as you're all aware, still very much uncertain where we're going. And it also leads to the prospect of food coming in from elsewhere in the world, potentially produced in, with methods that, that wouldn't, be, um, wouldn't be allowable within the UK and to a different environmental standards. So that's the challenges we have, but also there are huge opportunities. So there's very much an environmental focus now on food production and also we're looking at efficiencies within food production. Um, and UK farmers have got a really positive story to tell about their environmental profile, profile and about how they produce food efficiently on land. There are new markets emerging. So net gain, as we're going to talk about today, is probably one of the big ones, but also new markets for carbon. And we're starting to look at land slightly differently and look at what other services land can provide. Farmers, they're taking ownership of these, of these issues and creating the solutions and they're innovating, coming up with new production techniques, new techniques to build soil carbon, those sorts of issues. So farmers are really taking the lead on a lot of these opportunities. And then finally, we're seeing, particularly in 2020, huge public support for British produce. And British public have really got behind British farmers this year, really understanding the, the many benefits that buying British um, can provide for them. So I'll start by talking about the future of environment schemes. So for the past 30 to 40 years, British farmers have carried out a huge amount of work to encourage wildlife, benefit soil and water, mitigate their impact on climate. And a lot of that has been via agri-environment schemes. And there's been really substantial engagement by farmers in what are voluntary schemes. At its highest level, 70% of agricultural land was, it was within environmental stewardship. Now that truly is landscape scale delivery of environmental um, management. However, there's been a combination of policy changes, of complex scheme design and under-resourcing, which has led to a fall in, in uptake of agri-environment schemes in recent years. And the kind of comments that we get back from farmers is that they're concerned about the compliance issues, they're concerned about what happens if they get an inspection and it goes wrong. And they're concerned about um, having a penalty, which would mean that they would have to pay a substantial amount of the money back. So farmers are now starting to look at these schemes, you know, as, as, a, as a risky operation when they should be about supporting environmental delivery. So a future, a future policy should seek to address all these concerns and try to rebuild the goodwill amongst farmers. And the new schemes that will be developed as we go forward past Brexit do give us a chance for innovative thinking for on-farm environmental management. So why is this so important to UK farming? Um, what we're going through at the moment is a, is a period of transition. We're transitioning away from the funding um, schemes that were provided by CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, which was um, the European policy. And we're now moving towards a new environmental land management scheme, which is going to replace the bulk of the fun funding that farmers received from common agricultural policy. And within that, you had the basic payment scheme, which is a really significant funding scheme that with, with a few exceptions, most farmers within England would have received. 
and it was a very important source of funding very important for cash flow for some sectors and it underpinned a lot of the kind of capital investment that um, farmers would would be making it also replaces the previous agri-environment schemes like the um, environmental stewardship or countryside stewardship schemes that we've had um, and rolls everything into one and it's primarily now going to be about environmental management going forward so it's again a period of uncertainty of huge change and it's vital that we get the environmental land management scheme right so that it enables farmers to deliver for the environment there's not a lot of information available about how these schemes are going to operate but the pilots are due to start next year so this is being rolled out quite rapidly ELM is part of a wider DEFRA policy development, so it's only one part of it. The other elements are animal health and welfare, so there'll be a new support scheme coming up through that, and also farming productivity. And again, that's a very important um, element, which will help um, people to focus on the farming productivity, focus on efficient food production, and again, brings in things like net zero as well. So what are the goods and benefits that the future ELM scheme is going to incentivise? There's a whole list there. It doesn't include soil, as DEFRA see that as a natural asset rather than a public good or an outcome. But it does include clean air, clean water, thriving wildlife, um, protection from hazards, so that would include things like flooding, um, climate change, and then landscape heritage and importantly countryside access recreation and we've seen a huge amounts of well a huge increase in the amount of the people visiting the countryside over 2020 so again an important area for investment the bottom line though is that profitable farm businesses are required in order to deliver environmental outcomes successfully so from an nfu point of view what we'd like to see defra have proposed a three three tier model for the um, development of the elm scheme We'd like to see a first tier that would be available across the country and for all farm types and sizes. And options within that tier would be straightforward to comply with. It would deliver for landscape biodiversity in the wider environment. A second tier would be more ambitious with its environmental outcomes. It would have um, the conditions to create more complex management. So supporting priority habitats and habitat creation. Tier two could be tailored to local needs and provide bespoke support for farmers. Both tiers should include some form of land management option and some capital items. Capital items usually would be used for things like hedge restoration, tree planting, um, perhaps resource protection like fencing or tracks, those sorts of things. Um, DEFRA have also outlined that there will be a third tier the top tier and that's going to look at landscape scale change now that one the details are still emerging and that's possibly the most difficult areas for farmers to engage with how much uptake would there be the initial view from that we're having from farmers was that it will depend on the financial returns and the risks of engagement and that's based on their previous experiences of agri-environment um, which you know which were difficult recently so again it remains to be seen but we're hopeful that if we get a good scheme that most farmers will have something in there that they can engage with so on to new markets there are some major opportunities in the future for new markets but there are also an awful lot of questions that are being put to us by farmers and this slide just gives you a flavor of those questions Overall, the new markets, they need to be sustainable, they need to be fair, and they need to provide a reasonable income and return for farmers who are providing services. So some of the questions we're having are, well, who is going to establish new markets? There are various initiatives out there already, but it's potentially a confusing landscape for farmers. So you may find that some of the initiatives are only available in certain areas, and the other farmers wouldn't be able to access those. So at the moment, it's quite a patchy outlook. There's concern about the longevity of agreements. Um, farmers are being asked for very long-term agreements, and how do they have confidence in entering into agreement, potentially with a broker, and how do they know that broker will still be operating at the end of a 20, 30-year agreement? What happens to land once an agreement ends? Can it go back into agricultural um, production or would there be another opportunity for it again that is a significant potential barrier for, for engagement should we be looking at layering initiatives on land so 
if you have a piece of land, you should be able to enter it into the ELM scheme, look at natural capital markets, look at carbon credit, credits, etc. The ELM scheme talks a lot about collaboration between farmers. Now, farmers will tell you that that's a very difficult area, but they do already do that in a lot of ways, from knowledge transfer to sharing of equipment, etc. But there, is an, there are a huge amount of barriers and uncertainty in asking businesses to collaborate in an emerging market. The other issue is right option, right place. We're already seeing competing offers, offers for land use. So, for example, you know, local initiatives to provide free trees for planting for climate change. But is this being done in a way that considers the environment and it considers the effect on food production? And also from a farm business point of view, does it include all the other market opportunities that are potentially out there? And I think at the moment, one thing that farmers are concerned about is that if they follow up one option, does that then preclude them from getting involved in another market further on down the line? So just talking more specifically about net gain and the NFU view on net gain, the Environment Bill 2020 puts the 25 year environment plan onto a statutory footing and it contains a really ambitious scale of biodiversity delivery and it introduces mandatory net biodiversity net gain into the planning system. The net gain system needs to work with farmers and for it to become a realistic proposition the majority of offset providers are going to need to come forward from the agricultural sector without those offset providers the market for biodiversity offsets isn't going to function so we need to have a careful appraisal of the value of land i think the tendency amongst planners would be to direct net gain to areas of low productivity but then where does that place our upland farming systems who are so valued for landscape and biodiversity that they deliver and where does that leave the communities that it supports biodiversity offsetting also potentially takes land out of agriculture or leads to reduced productivity therefore offset provision should be focused on the area of lower productivity within a business context allowing the farmer to make the decision as their best place to understand the value of their land and it should also be undertaken where the offset complements food production within a farm business context Net gain offsets should also be able to layer with other income streams. So if net gain delivery is to deliver a biodiversity outcome, then it should be possible to sell other environmental outcomes on the same site. So for example, if you're creating a salt marsh, it should be possible to sell the carbon storage that's delivered alongside that. Farmers have the potential to deliver net gain. It could be commissioned by a local planning authority, by a developer, by a broker, or through some sort of tariff mechanism. But at the end of the day, the farmer should have the choice of who they contract with. As I've already mentioned, the length of the contract is going to affect the appetite of a farmer to be involved. The Environment Bill sets out a 30-year commitment for biodiversity net gain delivery. That could be a barrier to uptake for some. Um, most of our members when asked have said they would be looking for agreements that were for less than 20 years and again they've co concerned about what happens to land after an agreement ends but on the other hand payments for delivery and maintenance need to match the level of the commitment and take into account the risk that that land will become a permanent habitat um, feature so a farmer needs to consider how all of this and how the offset sits alongside their business interests and their future aspirations for their business So just briefly, before I hand over to Charles, I wanted to talk about the aspiration for net zero. The NFU has set out an aspiration to achieve net zero in agriculture by 2040. And we believe that this is, this is achievable. And this aspiration aligns with, other natural de with natural capital delivery via other mechanisms. Agriculture is uniquely placed to be part of the solution as it is an emission source and it's also an emission sink. And as farmers, farmers have a special role to look after the carbon reserves that they already have within the soils and other vegetation. But there's still a lot of learning to do. This infographic, it is, does paint a very simplistic picture, but it does, it's something that we're using with our membership to illustrate the challenges and potential opportunities as well. And if you'd like to find more, there's an awful lot of um, net zero activity that you can read up on on nfuonline.com. So in order to deliver net zero for agriculture, the NFU has developed three pillars. This is, it, there is, it's a national aspiration to achieve not net zero and it's, there's not an expectation that every farm would be able to reach net zero individually. 
many of the aspirations outlined here also fit in with Elm and new markets. But each farm is going to start from its own baseline. There will be farmers out there that have already done a significant amount of work towards achieving net zero. But there will be differences within sectors and there will even be differences between neighbouring farms. So pillar one, boosting productivity and reducing emissions. This focuses on a really wide variety of measures from controlling, um, using controlled release fertilisers, using precision agriculture, looking at fuel use, nutrient use, etc., to reduce emissions. Pillar two, and this is the area that fits most neatly in with natural capital, is about increasing farmland carbon storage. So increasing carbon within the landscape, looking at hedgerow management, increased tree planting and boosting soil organic matter. And pillar three looks at what farmers can do to, to create bioenergy through biofuels, biomass, renewables and soil amendments. So in summary, food production and land management policies have got to go in hand in hand to be successful. We need to have a fair financial payment for the services provided by farmers. Participation in agri-environment agri schemes as an offset provider or within a new market must be voluntary and there must be choice of the, of the mechanism a farmer engages with. And then the sector must be supported along its journey towards net zero. And with that, I'll hand over to Charles. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, very interesting indeed. 70 plus percent of land is used for agriculture in the UK. That's uh, that's huge. Um, well, thank you very much, very much again. Um, our second speaker today, as uh, Sarah mentioned, is Charles uh, Charles Cowart, uh, who is the author of the RICS Value of Natural Capital Report, as well as a number of other RICS reports and is visiting professor in rural land management at Harper Adams University. Today, Charles is kind of representing RSCS, which is the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and they are one of our licensed members. You would have seen their logo earlier. So they offer the Chartered Environmentalist Registration to Chartered Surveyors with environmental knowledge and specialisms, essentially. Uh, so a huge welcome to Charles. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Phil. Can you Excellent. hear me? I can indeed. Um, so Charles will be um, looking at the advisory and consultancy services which will be needed if ecosystem services and natural capital are to, to be developed successfully. Um, so and I believe I'm going to give it a quick plug now, but um, those who are interested in the environmental work of surveyors and beyond, if you have a look at the value of the planet, uh, campaign and content that RICS are, are producing at the moment um, that's a good place to look for that so RICS value of the planet I think uh, Charles is going to mention it anyway but uh, so Charles if you're ready I'm going to hand over to ready you when you are Phil yes okay over to you thank you very much good morning everybody and thank you for joining us on today's seminar as Phil has said I'm going to talk about the consultants role I'm a chartered surveyor I qualified too many years ago to uh, to remember really but I first became in, involved in environmental issues at about the time of the wildlife and countryside act of 1981 I was employed as a research assistant um, at the Royal Agricultural College as it was to look at the implications of management agreements that was followed by various voluntary activity really in the wildlife trust movement as a secretary of a county farming and wildlife and advisory group uh, and about 15 years ago I started to get involved in some ecosystem service and natural capital projects. I'm speaking as a chartered surveyor but our rules of conduct prohibit me from um, acting as an official spokesman for the institution but I would like to mention what Phil's already mentioned the value the planet campaign which the RICS is running and through the RICS my own involvement in developing professional thinking in these areas has really been uh, through uh, a few publications and several conference presentations. This one, it's no longer available from the website on account of its age, but it was a look back in September 2012 at challenges to international professional practice arising from the ecosystem services approach. More recently, value of natural capital, the need for chartered surveyors, not only to acquaint themselves with the processes used in environmental valuation, but to get actually far more involved in those things than they are now. 
My last point from an institutional point of view is to say that as of tomorrow, the institution expect, is expected to launch a, uh, a, a consultation on an amendment to the institution's uh, rules of conduct for its members. Broadly, this is extending the coverage within those rules of conduct of business responsibility questions. That's both environmental and social uh, questions and um, as it says on the screen there you can read it for yourselves I'm sure but this is about delivering professionalism public advantage embedding sustainability and respect into the behaviors expected of members of the of the institution and I'm sure that cuts across as a principle all uh, associate institutions of the society of the environment now let's turn our attention to the role of consultants in um, engaging with natural capital. I choose the word carefully engaging rather than promoting uh, to, to safeguard our position of independence, really. But what do consultants bring to any area of work that they get involved in? First of all, they know something. They know stuff. Um, secondly, they should know how to apply the stuff they know. And thirdly, they should be reliable because they've signed up to ethical frameworks and they can be trusted, therefore, by their clients. And that really gives us that gold spot in the middle where those three areas overlap. People look to us for independent, impartial and useful advice, which is backed up by our continuing education and uh, our adherence to codes and expectations of practice. But none of that is any good to a client unless it leads to useful outcomes in terms of profitable initiatives, practical work, uh, work which is compliant with whichever rules and regulations are in place at the time, and ideally uh, work which is sustainable in the long term, whichever perspective you take for the business. So are there markets for the role of consultants in natural capital? Let's have a look at that as our next question. This pie chart, uh, please do not rely on the size of the segments. They are actually totally arbitrary, but I hope they help to make a point. And what I've tried to do on here is to show some and they continue to grow some of the segments that make up what I might call for this presentation the market for natural capital services. We've already heard from Sarah about biodiversity or environmental net gain. Let's start with that at 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Carbon accounting and offsets. Some of you will no doubt be doing that already. Uh, I'm involved with a, co a consortium of firms consortium of firms who have um, set themselves the task of making sure that they know what their carbon impact is before they start pontificating to others about it. For some of us, the actual undertaking of natural capital valuation and accounting uh, will be an area of work. Environmental compliance, if we go down to six o'clock on my chart, and that will fit in with corporate responsibility. For instance, as of this year, we see that uh, larger corporations uh, have a, an obligation in their annual returns to Companies House to report on various environmental questions, including their carbon outputs. Conservation covenants are a new tool which is being brought to the Land Management Armoury courtesy of the Environment Bill. There will be a need to understand how they work, there will be a need to understand in what circumstances they are appropriate and how they are best framed. They will be particularly relevant to the question of biodiversity gain that Sarah mentioned. And of course there will be ELMS, but I've deliberately not given ELMS, the DEFRA and Welsh Government Environmental Schemes, too much space on this chart because I think we can get a little carried away with wondering what the government is going to pay farmers and landowners, when actually the real gains are probably in looking away from government towards other areas of opportunity. There will be site-specific payments if your land is essential to protecting infrastructure, to protecting villages or towns from flooding, uh, there may well be particular schemes which will pay you for those benefits. And alongside those, uh, perhaps part of them, there will be catchment and land scale projects where there are particular concerns around the quality of various rivers, the quality or joined upness of various landscapes. And as Sarah has stressed, not least 
uh, is the scope for improved recreation and access, the possibility of market opportunities in those areas, and the opportunities and the challenges, and dare I say it, the responsibilities of landowners that go with that. It's in the nature of my pie chart that it shows all these things as distinct sectors, but in practice the edges will be fuzzy, like the background picture on this slide, um, and they will bleed and overlap one into each other. So for instance, the two blue slices, biodiversity gain for planning and conservation covenants, in many cases will go hand in hand. And actually, they just keep coming in just in the last few weeks. We have seen that nitrate and phosphate reduction priorities have brought certain parts of the planning system grinding to a halt in parts of Dorset and southwest England because development can't proceed until there is, by order of natural England, um, a nitrate and phosphate reduction plan in place for the individual development. That's even reaching out to uh, permitted development work under the general permitted development order. Sarah's already mentioned biodiversity gain and I'd like to use that as an example. Um, the Environment Bill part six and seven are the required reading if you're interested in this but put diagrammatically here is your development site. It has a biodiversity value measured before using the DEFRA biodiversity metric and inevitably really after you've developed some of that biodiversity will have gone. Therefore, you will need to offset it elsewhere if you can't do it on the site. So you find an offset site. Sarah's mentioned that a lot of farmers see this as being an important opportunity and service they can provide. The farm that you're going to offset on, or whatever other land holding it is, has a biodiversity value before, measured according to the metric. What we are looking for is for that biodiversity value after to increase, not only to offset which is what has been lost on the development site, but to more than compensate for what has been lost on the development site. The magic figure is 10% in the Environment Bill. But looking to the future, the Secretary of State will have the power by regulation to amend that figure. Um, I think the odds are somewhat shorter on the figure being increased in the fullness of time rather than it being reduced. Just to give you an example, using the DEFRA biodiversity metric, which is in its second iteration now, a third one is promised before the end of the year, here's a very simple appraisal of a 500 acre farm. And I've said that uh, this farm has 160 hectares of cereals, it's got 10 hectares of arable margin game bird mix, there's some temporary or short term grassland on it, and there's a little bit of uh, mixed deciduous woodland, 10 hectares or about 25 acres. Um, that's 200 hectares altogether and applying the DEFRA biodiversity metric that means that there are 515 or thereabouts spatial biodiversity units. The farm also has some hedgerows and it has a line of trees. Um, they amount to 32.7 hedgerow units and it has two, canal, two kilometres of canal running alongside it as well. That gives it 32 river units. Um, this shows you a number of things about the biodiversity metric. There are three distinct categories. Um, they must not be mixed. Um, so you cannot compensate the loss of spatial units with more hedgerow units or, uh, or water river units or vice versa for that matter. The 10% challenge therefore uh, is across all three broad categories. Just last week at an RICS conference held online, uh, the Environment Bank, who specialises in giving access to offset sites, looked at a cost comparison of a 45 hectare housing site in Cambridgeshire. By their estimates, uh, they compared diverting some of the site to provide just 10% of the required biodiversity units, compared with 100% off offsets on a site elsewhere. They reckon the difference in cost would be an extra £61 million to do that. That rather underlines, I think, the money that might be at stake here. How did they do those sums? Well, part of it was in the loss of residential units that they could sell from the site. Part of it was in the value of the development land itself with planning permission compared with agricultural land. It's very specific to that site. The figures will be different elsewhere. But nevertheless, uh, it shows that we may be dealing with significant sums of money in some instances. 
not seen the biodiversity metric that De DEFRA has calculated, uh, been led to believe by consultants that uh, it is an arcane thing accessible only to specialists. Let us disabuse you of those notions. Go and have a look at DEFRA's website for itself. Download the metric, put some numbers in it, have a little play with it yourself. Um, you just need to be confident enough in, in uh, clicking a button to say yes when it asks if you're happy to activate the macros. So going back to the market segments, in my comments, I've really only talked about biodiversity gain. I've made a little bit of mention of carbon accounting offset, but there's a lot more on there that I've really made no mention of at all. But they are all there, topics for another day perhaps. Um, but what can we take away for these as the message for consultants from my presentation today? I think it's unlikely that any consultant will be active in every segment of this circle. Um, but nevertheless, understanding the scope of the market, watching its further development in the way that I outlined later on, um, will be very important, I think, to future consultancy opportunities. So that's commercial opportunities for consultancy businesses. But equally, in supporting others, particularly the farming community, but by no means exclusively the farming community, um, will um, will all be uh, important areas of work, particularly uh, for Society of the Environment members. That brings me to the closing of my uh, comments today. Thank you very much. As this picture illustrates here, once you're in a hole, stop digging. So that's what I'm going to do now, Philip, and uh, very happy to take questions from the audience. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Charles. And thank you again for, to Sarah for uh, your talk just a few moments ago. Uh, for those watching, uh, now it's time for some questions and answers. Um, so if you haven't already done so, now is the time to ask a question uh, using the Q&A function in your toolbar. And we'll do our best to get through as many as we can uh, before we get to one o'clock uh, UK time. Uh, so please ask your questions. I've had a couple in already. Um, to kick things off, we've actually had some questions from your registration. So when you registered, you had the opportunity to ask a question. We'll start with those if that's okay. Um, now, question number one, um, how can the concept of natural capital be made simpler? And I think that's probably based on, if, if you aren't a, uh, an environmental expert, but you want to use the concept to help improve the environment, are there, are, there, are there tools for people to look at that could help them start that process? Uh, shall I go to Charles maybe first? Yeah, that's, that's fine, Phil. Um, every sympathy with that concept. And uh, if anything, I think natural capital might have made it simpler than ecosystem services, just because the word natural and capital are perhaps more familiar terminology. My start point would be what nature does for me. It feeds me, it clothes me, it maintains my life through carbon and water cycling. It gives me the opportunity for recreation and inspiration. Shall I come in there? Um, do, we've yeah. been doing a bit of, 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 there's a bit of research going on locally, talking to farmers about what they think natural capital is and how familiar they are with the terms. And I think the difficulty is that, I think they're very familiar, obviously, with the land that they manage. And, um, you know, if you talk about the themes, there's, there's, there's a lot of understanding there about, you know, particularly with things like water management and um, flood risk management, farmers really intrinsically understand the land. The difficulty is when you then put it into the language that is used by policymakers and consultants, etc., the two don't necessarily marry up. So there is a bit of a, a job to do there just to, um, to, tr to try to make a lot of this information much more accessible to, to land managers and farmers. Okay, and I might just build upon that. Um, if you were looking to take those first steps to start a natural capital approach to, to how you're working, uh, as a farmer, where would be the best place to look uh, and start that process of learning, essentially? Sarah? Maybe? In terms of what, in terms of, um, you know, access to information there are a variety of, of sources out there already so obviously the nfu but you know lots of um you know the farming press um ahdb lots of organizations are out there equipping farmers with this information but i think a lot of them will have the baseline information already 
and you know that they will know what biodiversity there is on their farm they will know what species are there by and large and a lot of farmers have actually done sort of their own monitoring and data capture themselves so they'll, they'll have bird lists etc the issue going forward is how we all share this data and um, you know how farmers feel about sharing that data with with other parties I think that's the problem I think so. another place that it's useful to start Phil um, RICS has published a couple of useful booklets about it, of course. Um, but there is also a network called the Ecosystem Knowledge Network. Um, and they've got loads of stuff, published reports, videos, uh, you know, and there's lots of people offering seminars like this on natural capital now and more advanced training. But uh, a very good clearinghouse for a lot of this stuff is the EKN, Ecosystem Knowledge Network website. Um, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at those if you're seriously interested in this area. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to skip straight on to the question, the next question. Um, would more organic farming help with better land management for the benefit of the wider environment? Question about organic farming. I'll go to Sarah for that one. Yeah, um, well, I mean, or organic farming has, has its place within the production system, and there are a lot of NFU members out there who, who farm organically. Um, I think the difficulty is that it's not an either or. Um, conventional farming techniques, are, you know, are, can also deliver food and environmental sustainability. So, you know, we, it's about how you use um, plant protection products. Um, if you use them responsibly and sustainably, um, rather, you know, and, and, and I think we, we worry sometimes about it being pit, pitched as an either or, um, either or debate, really, because both systems have got their own merits and, and their own issues. So we shouldn't be um, just focusing on one production system and we should just be looking at all uh, if, if i could make a comment on that as as well i i echo what sarah has said and um i think it's also interesting to look at some of the pluses and minus and not a bad example of this is is carbon if you look at organic dairy production at the moment, one of the concerns of organic dairy farmers is that the carbon footprint of a litre of organic milk tends to be higher than the carbon footprint of, um, of a conventionally produced litre of milk. Mm. Some of that may be to do with the way we measure carbon, particularly in grassland management. There are shortcomings there. But I think that single example does highlight the difficulty of trying to make black and white conclusions about organic versus the rest. Mm. There's a lot to be said uh, for the notion that farming up to certain levels of intensity is making better use of land as an input to our needs um, than moving to very, very extensive systems and there we are I've, I've introduced another contrast between extensive and intensive and it's not mm. it wouldn't be right to say that extensive means organic and intensive means non-organic you know they're they're quite different parts of a matrix and these questions are complex that's enough on that to allow more time for questions but I do think it, it shows the challenges of it certainly sounds like there's some challenges there not just a black and white picture um so the first question we've had in uh, live from the webinar, large landowners have a huge responsibility in helping nature thrive, for example, through priority habitats and SSSIs. Um, will tier one elms ensure there are more criteria than just owning land? Um, what's the NFU's take on it? So I'll yeah. go straight over to Sarah. Um, well, the eligibility for the ELM scheme is a really key issue and DEFRA haven't really outlined um, what, they, what their view is on um, eligibility yet. And that's eligibility in terms of who and eligibility in terms of where as well. So that is a key, key unknown at this stage. I think the, the NFU view is that it's the active farmer who should be the claimant um, in the scheme going forward. You know, the tenanted sector, it's a very large sector. Um, there are a huge variety of, of tenancies and agreements out there. And you'll find that, you know, there are there are tenant farmers, there are farmers who, who are owner occupiers, and there are farmers that will be a mix of both. So we need a system going forward that enables all of them to engage with the, with the system. Charles, did you have any on that one on on the on the question about the agricultural holdings act uh phil yeah, yeah. the um 
it's not only the Agricultural Holdings Act which which causes difficulties. There's all sorts of definitions of agriculture and other things. Um, I think the um, the key thing there is that tenants need to speak to their landlords and landlords to their tenants. Um, and um, you know the 1986 Agricultural Holdings Act originated in the Agriculture Act of 1947 uh, and was more refined in the Agricultural Holdings Act of 1948. It was created for a very different time. It's arguable that one of the failings of the Agriculture Bill that is now before Parliament is that it signally fails to include a definition of farming for the 21st century. Whereas if you looked at the 1947 and 1948 acts, they actually gave us what at the time were regarded as appropriate for the time, the rules of good husbandry and the rules of good estate management. Where now are the modern rules of good husbandry and the rules of good land management? Uh, big missed opportunities. Uh, so there are legal pitfalls in the Agricultural Holdings Act. Um, and in the farm, in, in the Agricultural Tenancies Act as well. Um, with goodwill, they can be overcome. Uh, with bad blood, they will continue to cause endless problems. So understanding the position individually is really, really important. I said the other examples. I was asked recently um, for whether uh, payments for carbon paid to woodland owners would be exempt as forestry income because you don't pay income tax on commercial forestry. Um, somebody promoting carbon payments had said they would. Uh, actually, if you delve into the Finance Acts and find out what is the exemption for commercial forestry, it simply talks about commercial forestry and doesn't define it. Uh, selling carbon in your trees, does that equal commercial forestry? Does it not? We either need the government to tidy that, that up in a Finance Act, uh, or we need a tax tribunal to decide a case um, on it. Uh, you know, these are all these are all important questions, detailed questions, actually. You know, well beyond the strategic considerations, but but they're, they're important questions. Okay, I'm not going to try and ask any more questions about that because it goes far beyond my knowledge. Uh, however, trees and uh, woodland were ma were mentioned, um, and if you want to learn about more or more about natural capital and trees and how the trees how trees fit into that, then uh, sign up for the webinar next week, which is the next in this series. Uh, so a little bit of a plug there. Um, okay, to what extent will what we've outlined in both presentations apply to Scotland? There's been a bit of a focus on DEFRA and so on. Um, if I come to uh, Charles first, are there yeah, any key sure. differences? Yeah, key differences. The biodiversity gain elements in the Environment Bill are purely English measures. Um, as set out in the bill, they don't apply to Scotland or Wales. Nevertheless, the Scottish and Welsh governments are looking at biodiversity gain. Some local planning authorities still have already have it as part of their local planning policy approach rather than a legal obligation. Despite the biodiversity metric being um, a, a DEFRA owned um, tool uh, that is being used in Wales and Scotland. Um, there are uh, also a lot of initiatives in Scotland around peat as there are in England but there's a big peatland action program and so on. So there are there are detailed differences. There is however a common underpinning of approach and stressing of natural capital as, as a way ahead really. Sarah would you like to add to that? I don't think I can add to that. I think... <laughs> Okay. Whilst we're talking about different um, areas of the world, how does the environmental impacts of UK farmers and landowners compare to other countries? Do you have any insights on that, Sarah? I don't have any data or information. I think okay. that the key thing has been the debate about international trade that's been going on over the last couple of months. And it's really thrown up and highlighted, you know, the, the differences in production standards across across the globe, really. And, you know, farmers in the UK do have, um, you know, very stringent legislation that they have to comply with. Once we start to look at importing foods from other parts of the world, you know, those um, those requirements won't necessarily be there and we'll be in a situation where potentially we're importing food from elsewhere in the world that wouldn't you know that you wouldn't be able to produce using those systems in the UK so that then places our farmers at quite a serious competitive disadvantage so that's one thing that you know the NFU is is really keen to stress at the at the moment while trade talks are ongoing because it is crucially important for our sector that we have a level playing field I think I think another aspect of that as well 
Phil. Um, not many weeks tend to go by without us being told of the terrible environmental impact of beef production and that we shouldn't eat beef anymore. Um, if you try to explore where that comes from, um, a lot of the work that led to those headlines was based on intensively reared beef, um, which is on, you know, feedlots where the beef, the cattle don't graze. Uh, they're fed maize or other cereals which have been grown particularly to feed the cattle. And inherently that is pretty inefficient because you're growing the crop to feed it to the cattle to make the beef. And there's, there's, there's a loss of energy at each stage of that process from the final thing. Um, uh, and, and then you ship that beef around the world to get it here. Um, compare that with traditional grass reared um, beef and ask yourself what you would do instead with that land. Now there are choices, you could grow trees on it, you could have sheep on it. Um, what you couldn't by and large do is grow uh, vegetables and cereals very successfully on a lot of the grassland because it's the, the soil and the climate and all the rest of it isn't there for it. Equally think about the impact of the food you, be, the food you eat. Next time you buy um, some of those nicely trimmed beans wrapped up in cellophane in a supermarket, look at where they've come from. If they come from a country like Kenya, uh, most of what you're about to eat is water. Kenya is a drought stressed country. You know, there are, it's not just the environmental impact of farming, but the environmental impact of consumption and the choices that we make that have to be considered. Sorry, I'm making it all grey and not black and white again, but the fact is it is grey and complicated. Um, and the point that Sarah made, made earlier on about the right choices in the right places is, is absolutely bang on for these issues. Okay, not a problem. Sounds like a lot of exploration required for each decision, really. Um, but there's tools out there out there to help. Um, next question is, the UK government has missed a lot of its biodiversity targets over the last 10 years. Um, do the panel think the new policy framework will produce better outcomes in the next 10 years? Um, if I go to Charles first, maybe? Uh, fine. Um, I, I think it, that gives you a bit of thinking time, Sarah. <laughs> well, I, never tell. I, think, I, I think the outlook is better than it has been. Um, whether I, I don't think, however, that we can uh, be looking to hit the gold or the bullseye uh, with these things, because uh, Malcolm also goes on um, to ask what policy improvements are needed to improve success. Um, I don't know if this is a policy improvement, but these initiatives all need to be resourced properly, um, whether that is central government resource in making things accessible, running ELM schemes properly, whether it is local planning authority resource in actually being able to handle uh, the biodiversity gain requirements in terms of being able to judge biodiversity gain plans and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and it also means the right amount of money being in the right place, which is, you know, a combination of not only direct funding, but also how the tax system works and the other regulatory frameworks are, are, are work. That's a big challenge by anybody's um, measure. And, uh, you know, short term political sight lines tend not to be very sympathetic to the achievement of good outcomes in those matters. Okay. Um, Sarah, any input on that one? Yeah, I think I think from from a farming point of view, and if you focus on agri environment schemes and what they've delivered, I think there's two issues. One is that there's been a lack of of data and monitoring. Um, so farmers have been farmers have taken on a ten year scheme commitment. There has been you know not a huge amount of support to help them to deliver that um, effectively over that ten year period, and you know there hasn't been um, you know an an appropriate way for them to really um, benchmark how, how they've been doing and how they've been what they've been delivering for the environment and that's potentially something that might change through ELM and it's something that you know we see as important to have that data data there so that farmers know what they're delivering and know what they're delivering against um, so that we've got a better picture for what these um, schemes are delivering and if we're moving towards new payment systems where farmers are being paid by results then it becomes even more critical that we have a mechanism for farmers to to monitor and to collect data on their agri-environment activities okay uh, i'm going to go through probably two more questions and this first question i think probably covers two questions anyway um it's based around farming a hypothetical question. I am a farmer running a typical conventional mixed farming business. All land is owned. 
I want to take advantage of new opportunities in the net, in natural capital on my farm. Where do I start, uh, Sarah? That's a really difficult question at this stage because obviously the problem is that we don't know in terms of we don't know what elms will really look like we know that it's going to be just around the corner but we we have no sort of um no picture about what the options are going to be so i would suggest that it's basically about taking a good look at what you've got in terms of habitats and features on that farm um looking at where you sit within a catchment you know is it a water stressed catchment are there flooding issues you know are there local um flood uh, natural flood management projects around and about um you know what is your local water company offering in terms of funding for water quality you know what are the opportunities there for tree planting and just start to gather that information so that when these opportunities start to arise you're in a good place of, you know and you've got a good level of understanding of what kind of um features you you may be able to op to offer to a new market yeah, stock taking i think has to be the answer to that phil what have you got and sarah's touched on it um you might actually download that um that biodiversity metric from um from from defra and fill in the land uses you've got mm. and see which ones would uh, get more biodiversity units um oh, that's pointed particularly at biodiversity gain but it would lubricate your thinking more widely than that as well i think once you saw it there that'd be that'd be a nice 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 sort of little tool to play with that you could 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 play with of a of a of a wintry cold winter's evening by the fire on the laptop um mm. there Maybe there are better ways to spend a wintry cold evening by the fire. But <laughs> it very much depends on preference, really, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, our last question. Uh, many of the costs of farming are externalised. Uh, nitrate and phosphate pollution of rivers, pesticides leading to uh, be stripped, needing to be stripped from uh, drinking water, methane emissions from ruminants. Um, will elms make any difference? I'm probably going to go to Sarah again, if that's okay. Um, uh, that's a, a really difficult question, um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, farmers, when they're, they're selling, you know, global commodities into the food supply system. So one of the, one, I mean, it comes back to what I've said all the way through the, through the, um, through the presentation that is that you need a profitable business to be able to invest in environmental management and i think we need some recognition that if we if we want farmers to invest in you know um techniques that protect water quality um and that they are able to make investments in their businesses that deliver those sorts of sustainable sustainability um, um outcomes then they need a profitable business and that that um you know that needs to be embedded in everything so it's it goes way beyond elms i mean elms is obviously important and it will make a start but we need to be looking at um new new markets and new mechanisms to deliver the funding to in order in order to um tackle those issues yeah i think something else on that that phil if you go back to the government's white paper or command paper on the future of agriculture, it was called Health and Harmony a couple of years ago. It talked about raising the bar on the pollute the pays principle. Uh, that's a nice way of saying look out for tougher regulations, even though it also said that uh, they'd be better managed than the previous regulations. If I could crave your indulgence, there's a couple of other questions on there, which I think it would be quite handy to to give a few pointers uh, to people. Um, somebody anonymous has asked about carbon calculator tools at farm level. Um, if you want to look more widely, you can do a lot worse than look at the work of the Carbon Trust. Uh, they point you towards a couple of different approaches and set out a method for doing it. Um, and there's, there's heaps of material out there if you take the trouble to look. So Carbon Trust, Google them, and that'll take you to lots of other stuff. There's a publicly available standard which covers it as well. Uh, and James asked about looking away from government incentives. Mm. Um, why do I say that when farmers are so reliant on subsidies to maintain a profit? Um, because I don't think they can rely on those subsidies to maintain a profit anymore in anything like the same way, James. And, uh, and if I were a progressive farmer myself, easy to say when I'm not, um, I would have been spending the last decade or so thinking about how I can set up a business that doesn't rely on CAP payments. Um, and uh, if you want to acquaint yourself with agricultural history, uh, the great betrayal of 1921 was when the government dumped its promises to support agriculture, which only the previous year it had said it would give three years notice of if they were to be changed. 
perfidious Albion or what? <laughs> okay, positive way to end the webinar. Um, that's, <laughs> well, thank you very much again to Charles and Sarah for spending some time with us today uh, and some really interesting insight there. Um, as mentioned at the start of the webinar, this is the third part of a five-part uh, natural capital webinar series. Uh, we therefore have two webinars uh, coming up in this particular series, which are on your screen at the moment. Uh, part four has a focus on woodland creation and embedding natural capital into sustainability strategy, and that's next week. Um, and to conclude the series, we hear from Chartered Environmentalist Paul Leinster, uh, who is a member of the Natural Capital capital committee and would explore the application of natural capital approaches so if you are free on those particular dates then they are ready for you to register for again they are uh, free webinars for you to enjoy and learn from um, and then we also have some more webinars coming up that you might interest you as well especially if you aren't currently a chartered environmentalist and you're looking to become one um, we have a How CM Has Helped Me and My Career webinar, uh, where we hear from three chartered environmentalists uh, from Eshcon, Thames Water and Jacobs, uh, and they are registered via IEMA, SIWEM and the IES respectively. So that might be an interesting one for you to find out how it kind of helps uh, somebody in their career uh, to have environmental chartership. Um, and we also have uh, an assessor insight uh, to achieving CMs, looking at the skills required for a successful chartership application, uh, something that Sarah has already gone through, for example. Um, and we hear from uh, Tina Benfield and Marilena Cariampa, I hope that's pronounced correctly, uh, representing CIWM and the IES, respectively. Again, free registration, head to the website that is on your screen now. Um, if you're interested to hear more about CM or RF Tech or any of the other, or watching any of the other series that we've had previously, this is our seventh series, um, then if you head to our YouTube channel or the website on your screen, you'll find all the review recordings on there. And this webinar will join those recordings in the coming days. The last note from me, um, the Chartered Environmentalist community has recently been telling the world about their vital work and why they do it. Um, so if you're, again, if you're aspiring to become a Chartered Environmentalist or an environment professional more widely, this is a good place for some really good insights and inspiration from across sectors and disciplines uh, and across continents as well. Um, if you are a CM, uh, there is no time to get involved. If you just search for the hashtag IMCM on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, um, you'll find some aspire, uh, inspirational videos, uh, interviews, webinars, some wise words of advice, and, uh, and quite a lot more. So have a look at that. And that's about it from us today. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and taking part. Um, if you're watching on uh, the recording on YouTube, if you can subscribe to our channel and hit the like button, that would be fantastic. It always helps spread the word a little bit more and helps the algorithm, always helps the algorithm. So thank you for that. Uh, many thanks again to Sarah and Charles for some excellent content. And we will see you in the next Natural Capital webinar, which is next week. Uh, so thanks again for watching. Stay safe. And it's over and out from me.